This will be the 25th presentation in the series entitled Visions of the Kingdom Age, which has been the Adult Sunday School continuing class theme at the Cranston Rhode Island Ecclesia. In our previous presentation, we asked a question as to why our Creator so frequently identifies the enlightened community and particularly the saints with the number 12. A long list of examples were given to validate the legitimacy of that question, drawing from both of our Creator's avenues of testimony, the written Word of God, being the Bible, and the spoken Word of God, being the operating features and terms of creation, and how these two avenues perfectly parallel each other, such as how the structural operating framework of the universe is an exact match for the divine encampment design of the enlightened community in the wilderness when the kingdom of God was established in Mount Sinai. There certainly is an extreme pattern presented to identify the enlightened community with the number 12. The legitimacy of this pattern and the volume of its application dramatically highlights our why question. Why does Yahweh do this? What is the point he is emphasizing? In this endlessly repeated shadow pattern. Our Creator is not whimsical or frivolous. There has to be a motivation. We want to know why. However, in, a, in another avenue of validation, we considered the frame for this particular question. The divine use of mathematics in both scripture and the terms of creation. We noted how world-famous mathematicians have obsessed <laughs> over what they have considered to be the unreasonable effectiveness in how mathematics has the capacity to so perfectly define the features of nature, or as we in the enlightened community prefer to say, creation. We noted how it has actually been emotionally unsettling for these famous mathematicians for over 2,000 years to witness the consistency and perfection in the mathematical patterns that define our environment. Let's just validate that frame with a couple more scientifically determined examples, simply to re-emphasize the significance of our original question. Uh, back in the mid-19th century, an Anglican priest named E. W. Bullinger wrote a book titled number in scripture. Bullinger was a master researcher, revealing extensive number patterns found in scripture that demonstrate specific related principles. However, despite being a very effective researcher in Bible number patterns, it was impossible for him to understand what those patterns communicated, as he was an Anglican priest. Therefore, he believed in such divinely insulting doctrines as the Trinity, the immortality of the soul, and an evil immortal angel, doctrines all springing from the serpent perspective uh, in Eden and originally developed in all the pagan religions. There's no possible way Bullinger could understand how the three eights found in the cumulative total of the six Greek letters in the name of Jesus projected the three immortalization events in the Creator's plan. Bullinger believed in the serpent lie, that we don't really die, that there's no uh, transition into immortality from mortality. A lie promoted by the corrupted Christian church prophesied in Revelation 17 as being the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Bullinger had the research details right, but the interpretations absolutely wrong. However, this his research certainly revealed an incredible degree of mathematical patterns below the surface in the Bible. This recognition validates our premise that our omniscient creator uses numbers and mathematics in his intentionally complicated communication policy that act as a filter separating those with circumcised hearts from those without circumcised hearts, giving more to those that already have, while simultaneously taking away what little is possessed by those who have not, as Jesus explained to his disciples 
When they asked why, he insisted on teaching only with confusing parables instead of plainly. Another more subtle but mathematically more extensive validation for the legitimacy of our considerations would be the research done under the direction of Professor Eli Ripps uh, at the Hebrew University. Professor Ripp and his team published research in 1994 in the highly regarded statistical science journal entitled Equidistant Letter Sequences. <clears throat> Although this research was promoted as a kind of Bible code, that was not the true nature of the research. Just a way for the media to sensationalize the research and for the endless parade of Bible critics to have some kind of platform for objection. Using computers, the researchers placed the book of Genesis in its original Hebrew lettering into a block format with a continuous text flow without any letter spacing. Then they searched for related sets of words that might be found intersecting vertically or horizontally or diagonally in the frame of examining the text with an equidistant letter frame. In other words, they would look to see if the words chair and table or hammer and saw might be found intersecting in the text in the format of looking at every third letter or every fourth letter, fifth letter, all the way, if I remember correctly, to the number 50. Professor Eli Ripp and his team at the Hebrew University in Tel Aviv had performed equidistant letter sequences, sequence computer searches for 300 sets of related words throughout the Hebrew text of the book of Genesis. They discovered a miraculous, consistent sub-testimony in the text. But when they attempted to publish their research, the Statistical Science Journal staff refused on the basis that their research just had to be flawed or could be demonstrated in any other book because there's no possible way the Bible could actually be what it claimed to be, testimony from the creator of the universe. So the researchers were tasked with running the same test on a copy of War and Peace, translated into Hebrew but limited to the same number of letters in the book of Genesis and using the same block format. There was no similar pattern at all, in any way, shape, or form, using the exact same test pattern that worked perfectly with the book of Genesis. The editorial staff still <laughs> refused to accept the research as legitimate and required two more test assignments, identifying prominent Jewish men's names along with either the date of their birth or death, whatever might be available. Both tests demonstrated the same flawless pattern in Scripture that was not evident in any other format. The research was then reluctantly published in Statistical Science Journal in Volume 9 in 1994. The editor of the Statistical Science Journal Professor Robert Cass was mystified at how the book of Genesis could actually contain details of modern day individuals. In fact, Professor Cass added this defensive prefacing statement when the research was published in the summer of 1994. And I quote, when the authors used a randomization test to see how rarely the pattern they found might arise by chance alone, <laughs> They obtained a very highly significant result with p or probability equals 0 0.000016. Our referees were baffled. Their prior beliefs made them think the book of Genesis could not possibly contain meaningful references to modern day individuals. Yet when the authors carried out additional analyses and checks, the effect persisted. The paper is thus offered to stat statistical science readers as a challenging puzzle." End quote. Unfortunately, what happened after this research was published was all the wannabe corruptors were drawn out of the woodwork producing their own Bible code books. They were all 
horribly researched and easily discounted, uh, such as the book entitled The Bible Code by Michael Drosnan. Personally, I, I could not read through more than half of that book. It was just too painful. Such incredible nonsense that only served to discredit the legitimate scientific research of that Hebrew University team. In addition to those who only wanted to parasitically feed off the sensational value of this mathematical research, there were also scientists absolutely desperate to discredit the obvious powerful validity of the Bible through this research and began publishing papers claiming it was, only, it was only the structure of the research that produced this effect. There was no miraculous mathematically based validation of the Bible. That response too was incredibly shallow and easily dismissed as foolishness and very unscientific, inspired by the need for most of humanity to have no other God than what can be found in their own mirror. Our point, however, was simply to reinforce the legitimacy for examining the mathematical consistency and the obvious and less than obvious patterns demonstrated in the Bible and how perfectly they blend with the operating model of creation's natural order, our Creator's secondary avenue of testimony. So let's return to our original why question with reinforced confidence in the legitimacy of the question and the determined intention to witness those hidden truths about our Creator's eternal rightness and illuminate that path to become more like Him and to participate in the unimaginable benefits of His eternal image and likeness. At the conclusion of our previous class, we referenced the understanding that each of the four divinely designed temples each had three progressive holiness divisions, and how this parallels the three stages in the development of the saints in each of the four divinely mandated but separate educational stages in our Creator's plan. Uh, these temples and the educational stages were uh, the tabernacle, uh, secondly was uh, Solomon's temple, which was eventually destroyed by the Babylonians, the post-captivity temple, expanded by Herod, uh, but destroyed by the Romans, and the future millennial kingdom temple. The four divinely appointed educational stages, uh, punctuated by a change in divine laws and rituals, and a change in the divinely appointed priesthood, and validated by powerful public displays of divine power, are the patriarchal age, the first kingdom age, sometimes legitimately called the Mosaic age, the ecclesial age, and fourthly, the millennial kingdom age, which can also be called the restored kingdom age. Now, just as there are three holiness stages in each of those temples, shattering how the saints will serve as the antitypical sanctuaries of the Creator when He takes His rest and those who have known him and loved him, no matter the personal cost. So there are also three stages in the development of the saints in each of the four ages in the plan of the Creator. These are enlightenment, commitment, and performance. These three stages are shadow projected through a number of divinely designed ritual progressions. We were only able to highlight one of those progressions in our previous commentary, demonstrating this threefold progression of enlightenment, commitment, and performance. This was observed in the three applications of the blood uh, of the sacrificial ram in the ordination of the priesthood when that first kingdom of God was initiated at Mount Sinai, with the blood being applied to the right ear, the right thumb, and the right large toe. The ear hears, indicating enlightenment. The thumb permits grasping, indicating what we choose, presenting that second stage of commitment to the truths, principles, 
and responsibilities presented in the Enlightenment stage. The large toe acts as the rudder of the body, permitting us to control our walk, our forward movement in a particular path, indicating the third stage of performance, demonstrating the divine truths and principles we learned and committed to live by. The number three is used extensively throughout our Creator's testimony in the context of a full cycle, a full maturing, uh, no matter whether that cycle is positive or negative. In 1st John, uh, yes, 1st John chapter 2, uh, we see itemized the full range of transgressional sin in three categories, being the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Uh, James 1 identifies the three maturing stages of sin in verses 14 and 15. Uh, James is inspired to write, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away with his own lust and enticed. Stage 1. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. Stage 2. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Temptation is the first stage, but mere temptation does not assign any guilt from which repentance is required. I mean, we're particularly told our Messiah was tempted in all points as we are, yet without any transgression. Uh, it's in Hebrews 4. It is the conception of that temptation into guilty sin that demands a repentance. This second stage is what our Messiah never permitted. But he did experience that third maturing stage of sin, when sin matures into death. Obviously, even if one never allowed temptation to conceive into guilty sin, that death still occurs, as death is the divine answer for sin. That righteous judgment of the Creator in the Garden of Eden, when the judgment of death was the righteously imposed was uh, uh, judgment on mankind. And the terms of the natural order, after sin corrupted, that previously very good creative order. Jesus experienced the first and the third sin maturing stages of temptation and death, but never the second. This is how he broke the power of sin in his voluntary, sacrificial death. This breaking of the power of sin in the flesh of our Savior was validated in how the temple veil, also representing the flesh of Christ, uh, ripped in two from top to bottom immediately upon his death. And why we break the memorial bread, also representing his body just like that temple veil. Therefore, it should be no surprise that just as the maturing of sin is expressed in three stages, so the divinely designed ritual projecting the process of a successful repentance from transgressional, transgressional sin would also include three stages, but in perfect compliance with our original question. There are 12 applications of blood. At those three stages in the repentance ritual in the laws of the first kingdom of God, there were six sin offering procedures for repenting from the guilt of personal transgressional sin. Um, the required offering for the high priest and the entire nation were exactly the same. This was the sin offering when the blood of the bullock offering went into the divine sanctuary. Although the priests were invited to eat the flesh of the sin offerings from everyone else, when that blood actually entered the divine sanctuary, the remainder of that sacrificial animal corpse had to be completely burned to ashes outside the camp. But in the same clean place, the ashes from the altar of burnt offering were being taken to be disposed of. In fact, it's quite interesting and perfectly seamless, that God expresses those sin-offering components 
in the context of six separate components that make up the whole. After all, the, the endless numerical identification of the features of the curse of sin and death all through the Bible highlight that number six. Here are the, here's the directions as given by God concerning this the refuse of this sin offering when the sacrificial blood actually entered the tabernacle. Uh, in Leviticus 4, starting at verse 11, notice the, the six components and the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head, three, with his legs, four, and his inwards, five, and his dung, six, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burned so even though god specifically commands that the entire remainder of the carcass is to be incinerated outside the camp he goes on to specifically identify that sin offering carcass as having six components the skin flesh head legs inwards and dung and then simply describes it as the whole bullock as we have repeatedly emphasized in this continuing series. Whenever we see redundant expressions in our Heavenly Father's testimony, this is an invitation to significant value being hidden in the text. Our society commonly dismisses redundancy as foolishness and a waste of time and a poor communication practice, but the Creator's testimony intentionally filters out the wise in their own eyes, and those with uncircumcised hearts. Yahweh employs precision redundancy to give more to those who already have while simultaneously taking away from those who have not. This is why God not only declares the entire sacrificial carcass has to be incinerated, but actually breaks down that carcass into six components that have to be converted from flesh to dust through fire. Just as all sinful flesh that does not participate in the three stages of repentance will suffer the judgment fires of God and suffer the eternal judgment of death, as dust is the divinely appointed icon of death. For when, from when Yahweh declared to our original ancestors, and I quote, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Further emphasizing our examination of this repentance ritual is the Apostle Paul's reference to how Jesus Christ qualified as this sin offering, and how we in the ecclesial age actually partake of that sin offering that was forbidden to the priests of the previous age. We read this in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 10. Uh, starting verse 10, we have an altar from which they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. The memorial service that we partake of, the broken unleavened bread and, and the wine, represent the body and blood of the ultimate sin offering. Our Messiah. Unlike the previous age when the priests were forbidden to eat any of the sin offering whose blood was actually taken into the divine sanctuary, we do eat of that sin offering from the Christ altar. So this consideration of the three stages of the 12 blood applications and the repentance procedures of the sin offering for the high priest in the nation are obviously highly significant to ourselves in this ecclesial age. So let's examine those three stages of 12 sacrificial blood applications in the repentance ritual for transgressional sin. We find this in Leviticus chapter 4, starting at verse 5. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood 
and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the, in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour out all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation." End quote. These three blood application stages perfectly parallel the ear, thumb, and large toe blood applications in the priesthood ordination ritual. They offer those exact same progressive enlightenment, commitment, and performance stages. The first blood application requires the spattering of the sacrificial blood exactly seven times on that tabernacle veil. Uh, there is great depth of meaning and purpose in this first stage. And we know from Hebrews 10 verses 19 and 20 that this veil represents the flesh of Christ, that humanity, that cursed human nature, where the serpent philosophy reigns from the throne of the human heart. That flesh nature of our Messiah was prophesied more than once to be the signature doctrine of the Antichrist development from within the enlightened community in 1st and 2nd John. The absolute first stage in repentance is to recognize the righteousness in the divine judgment of death for sin in the Garden of Eden and recognize that if our Messiah did not share that sin-cursed nature, then he would never have been able to condemn sin in his flesh, that human nature he was born, with, born into that demanded his mother had to offer the usual sin and burnt offerings for her own atonement for simply giving birth to the Son of God, as is noted in Luke chapter 2. The reason that the blood of the sin offering in that first repentance stage had to be spattered exactly seven times on that veil of Messiah's flesh is because that will be the divine limit of sin and sin's influence in all of creation. Sin will continue no more than seven times or seven millenniums in the Creator's plan. After the end of the millennial kingdom, that last enemy, death, will be eliminated cast into the symbolic lake of fire that is interpreted for us as the second death in Revelation 20, that, that eternal death. When death is eliminated, then sin is automatically eliminated, as there can be no sin if there is no death. Death is the divine answer for sin. The wages of sin is death. We learn that emphatically in the baptism ritual. It should be understood that the spe a, a specific verb is used in reference to that, highlight, uh, that sprinkling, or more appropriately, spattering of the blood in all of the sin offering rituals. The Hebrew word zarak is used in reference to, the more, to more dainty and gentle sprinkling of the blood in the context of the other blood offerings. But naza is the Hebrew word used for the application of the blood in reference to all sin offerings. Naza indicates a far more violent handling of the blood, much more of a spattering, or spurting, than a dainty sprinkling. This declares how the ultimate sacrifice for sin will be based in violence. That sin, that serpent influence, will not surrender its authority meekly or without a fight. That violent nature of our Messiah's crucifixion was absolutely necessary. And Shadow prophesied in the unique and violent blood spattering of the sin offerings, Shadow projecting from the substance of our Messiah's experience. So, the first 
of the three stages in the 12 applications of the blood in the sin offering for the high priest and the nation, projecting the process of repentance, was to violently spatter the sacrificial blood exactly seven times on the veil, representing that sin-cursed flesh nature of our Messiah. This is the Enlightenment stage recognizing how forgiveness for our guilty sins can be afforded on the basis of our correct understanding concerning our Messiah's confirmation of the righteousness of his Father's judgment in offering in the offering of his own sacrificial blood, our Messiah's life. Enlightenment is stage one in the development of the saints and the process of forgiveness. Stage two for the sin offering blood was not spattering but smearing that life blood onto the four horns of the golden incense altar therefore making a total of 11 cumulative blood applications and, uh, uh, through the second stage the incense altar is also interpreted for us in scripture Psalm 141 and Revelation 8 both identify the offering of incense with the offering of prayer this represents the second repentance stage of commitment. When we actually ask for forgiveness through prayer, prayer certainly demonstrates that second commitment stage. An enlightened rejecter doesn't feel any compulsion to ask forgiveness for contradicting the terms of our Creator's righteousness. The, that third and last uh, blood application uh, is when the huge bulk of that sacrificial blood is poured, not spattered, not smeared, but poured out at the base of the altar of burnt offering, that Christ altar. This is the twelfth application of the blood at the third station in the ritual of repentance for sin under the laws of the kingdom of God. Pouring out the bulk of that sacrificial life blood at the foot of the altar represents the third stage in the divine processing of the saints. Performance. How we pour our lives out at the feet of Jesus Christ, following our enlightenment and our commitment. We have to live in a repentant fashion not just be well-intentioned. There are conditions for God's forgiveness. It is never automatic. This three-station, 12-blood application ritual is an exact match to the three blood applications of the priesthood ordination in this context of enlightenment, commitment, and performance. But that sin offering ritual is only the second of the many template examples for this divine shadow pattern demonstrating the three maturing stages of the saints of enlightenment, commitment, and performance in each of the four educational stages in the plan of the Creator, explaining why our Creator so frequently identifies the saints with the number 12. Our next example will be the three mandated morning and evening rituals performed every single day, every day of every year, three in the morning and three in the evening. Just like those three days and three nights, Jesus said he would be under the power of death in the grave, just like how the six hours of our Messiah's crucifixion was separated into three hours of light and three hours of darkness. These three rituals, in the order of their observation, were first the replenishing of the fuel for the seven lamps, with their appropriately three to the left and three to the right of the shaft design. Second was the burning of the incense, with their four equal spice in, uh, components of anica, galbanum, stock tea, and frankincense that had been ground into a fine uh, aromatic dust. And that was followed by the first and last blood offering 
of every day on the Christ altar burnt offering, the one lamb daily burnt offering. Do we notice the exact same quantities in all three progressive rituals as our last example of the enlightenment commitment performance pattern? As seven blood spatterings in the repentance ritual, seven laps to replenish in the first of the three daily morning and evening rituals, four incense altar horns to smear with blood, matching four incense ingredients to burn on the incense altar. We have the single complete pouring out of the remainder of the bullock blood at the Christ altar, and we have the single burnt offering lamb offered on the Christ altar. Three sets in a progression highlighting a total of 12, just like our answer for why God identifies the saints so frequently with the number 12. It's the same progression in these three daily rituals of enlightenment, commitment, and performance. I mean, it would be pretty difficult to miss the connection between refueling the seven golden lamps and the principle of enlightenment. Lamps provide light. The refueling of the olive oil in the seven lamp reservoirs ensures the sustained lighting of the holy chamber of the tabernacle for the next 12 hours. And the divine command was that those seven lamps were never to be allowed to be extinguished. The second uh, morning and evening ritual is the burning of the incense. As we've noted, both the Old and New Testament identifies the incense with prayer. Only those who have chosen to respond to their enlightenment will pray to God. That four-spice mixture was crushed into a fine aromatic dust and blended in order to be burned. We see that same lesson of the dust, that recognition of our dust nature, our mortal nature, that is humbly recognized in our prayers in the context of our hope to be divinely freed from that condemnation to dust. It is the burning of the incense that transforms that aromatic dust into the ascending cloud. Just as those who have chosen our Creator's righteousness will suffer the fiery trials of our commitment to the divine truths and principles of enlightenment that are so contradictory to the self-worshipping delusions of the society of the sons of men. A perfect parallel is how two handfuls of those four blended incense spices were converted into a cloud through fire in the most holy chamber on each day of atonement, and this saved the life of the high priest. Two handfuls of incense, just like the daily morning and evening incense burnings of four incense ingredients each. This conversion of the, those eight dust components between the two hands into the one cloud that veils the Shekinah glory between the cherubim saves the life of the high priest. In that first of the three rituals the high priest would perform on every day of atonement. The burning of the incense in that second evening and morning ritual during the first kingdom of God is a portrait of commitment just as the fueling of the golden lamps is a snapshot of enlightenment. The third and last morning and evening ritual was the daily burnt offering. This lamb offering was always the first and last offering on that bronze Christ altar every day. Hosea tells us exactly the behavioral response God expected from this offering. We read in Hosea 6 and verse 6, God says, For I desired mercy, and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God, more than burnt offerings. Well, this is a statement of purpose for the two positive blood altar offerings, the peace and burnt offerings. Uh, the word mercy is translated from the Hebrew word kased, meaning a mercy springing from love as opposed to being motivated by uh, pity, empathy, or even bribery. The Hebrew word translated sacrifice is zabak, which exclusively 
indicates the peace offering, not offerings in general. Merciful love was the behavioral response Yahweh wanted from the peace offering. It was a dedication to the knowledge of his divine truths and principles that God expected from the performance of the daily burnt offering. This is the third morning and evening ritual, indicating a dedication to that enlightenment we have committed ourselves to pursue. This is the performance stage, where we do what we know to be divinely right and pursue the path of enlightenment that we've chosen. So we see the same progression of three in the context of twelve, presenting a pattern of enlightenment, commitment, and performance. This same progression is also emphasized in the three rituals that would be performed at the door of one's home. There were only three, no more, no less. The first was that writing of the first and greatest commandment on the door and gate of one's home. The second was the painting of the Passover blood on three of the frames of one's doorway, the two posts and the lintel never, never on the threshold. The third was boring open the ear of the Hebrew indentured servant who refused his freedom in order to stay and serve his master for the rest of his life. This too was done at the door of one's home. Let's read about this first set of instructions, projecting the first stage of coming to understand our Creator's truths. In Deuteronomy uh, 6, we read, in, um, starting in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto their children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and these shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house, and on thy gates." End quote. Jesus defines this commandment as the greatest of all the commandments. In addition to discussing them constantly, this was to be written on the doorposts and gates of one's home. The reason this was the greatest of all commandments is that it is both the destination and the map for participation in the blessings of the enlightened who choose to demonstrate the truths and principles of that enlightenment. In Mark 12, Jesus reports that first, that full first and greatest commandment was, and I quote, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. That first declaration defines the plan of the Creator, the destination of the faithful. It says, Hear, O Israel, listen closely to this, Israel, Yahweh, he who shall be our God, our Elohim, our mighty ones, is Yahweh, he who shall be one. He who shall be our mighty ones is he who shall be one. This is an expression of the foundational principle of God manifestation. One who will become many, who will all be one. Simply expressed, the principle of God manifestation is an understanding of multitudinous singularity, where many components blend harmoniously into a single, perfectly harmonious whole. Another way of expressing this is where Paul defines the result after Jesus delivers the kingdom to his father, after that last enemy, death, is eliminated, and the creator is said to be all in all, that everything that exists in all creation will be in perfect harmony, a complete oneness with Yahweh. He will become many who will all be one. The commandment that followed this expression serves as the path of participation in the plan of God, to love him with all our heart and life and strength 
to make the love of God the greatest love in our lives, greater than the love of our wife or husband, greater than the life of our children, grandchildren, parents, greater than the love of our brothers and sisters in Christ, and far greater than the love of our neighbor, which only has to be equivalent to a love of self. This understanding of the plan and purpose of God was written on the same doorposts that were painted with blood at Passover. When the Israelites painted the Passover lamb's blood on the two doorposts and lintel that they were, they were indicating that they were choosing life, that death might pass over them. They were publicly declaring to the world they accept the terms of Yahweh's offer to escape that condemnation of death. This ritual performed at the door of one's home projects that second development stage of the saints, choosing to pursue the counterintuitive terms of our Creator's righteousness. The third and last ritual performed at the door of one's home was the conversion of an indentured servant into a lifelong slave. Hebrew indentured servants were to be set free in their seventh year of service and awarded an abundance from the goods of their former master as a stake in their new life of freedom. However, an indentured servant could choose to stay and serve their master for the rest of their lives. We see this uh, presented in Exodus 21, beginning in verse 2, where the law is, If you buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, even to the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Again, it would be very difficult to disassociate this ritual with our third development stage of the saints, that of performance, faithful service, in demonstrating the righteousness of our Creator to which we have been enlightened, to which we have committed. This may be the inspiration why the Apostle Paul uses the Greek word doulos, to describe his status as a servant of Jesus Christ, as that Greek word indicated a bought and paid for slave, not just a, a hireling, not, a, not an eight to five employee on Monday through Friday, but a 24 seven owned slave. These three rituals performed at the door of one's home project that same three stages of development required for the development of the saints in each of the four educational stages in the plan of God, demonstrating why our Heavenly Father constantly identifies the enlightened community with the number 12. One creational avenue of testimony for this shadow testimony of the three stages of development so that the saints might be born again into that spirit nature, escaping an eternal condemnation of death, would be the three distinct trimesters in the 280-day, uh, that 40-week, uh, that gestation period, that 40-week pregnancy experience in order for a new life to progress from conception to an independent life. There is an absolute wealth of divine testimony and prophecy about our Creator's eternal truths and principles that is projected from this process of having children. It's another example of how our Creator uses numbers to communicate through His intentionally complex policy exclusively for the benefit of those within the enlightened community possessing seeing eyes and hearing ears. One of those shadowed truths in the birthing process 
is the three stages of development, the three transition points in the fetal development that even the unenlightened sons of men can easily witness and recognize, but haven't got the slightest clue to what those three development stages represent in the context of our Creator's whispered testimony. Another creational pattern would be the four seasons of three months each in a single year as the earth rotates around the sun. Our presentation time may be limited, but our individual capacity to pursue this theme is not. We cannot plumb the full depth of our Heavenly Father's testimony. This brief examination certainly does not exhaust the applications for answering our original question about why God identifies the saints with the number 12 so frequently. There's always more glory to see in how our Heavenly Father's two avenues of testimony, the Bible and creation, His written and spoken words, how they harmoniously blend their many individual components into a perfect, seamless, singular declaration of the eternal truths and principles of our God.